Welcome to another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross, licensed agent with Second City Real Estate. With me, as always, is Mark Ainley, founder and co-owner of GC Realty. Mark, how are we doing over there? Good. I think we found a new fun way to kick off the show because I think I'm going to make faces and, and try to get you to laugh and try to get you to either A, mess it up so everyone can hear, or B, we get a fun blooper. So I think, uh, I think we're onto something here. I could just minimize the Zoom so I don't see you, but no, I look you right in the eyes. <laughs> I almost feel like you look right in my eyes. I'm like, he's looking at me. I got to do something funny. Like, so it's so funny. So, all right, good. But we found a way to have fun with that intro. But, <laughs> and, uh, I, and I'm looking at you, speaking of looking in, looking at you in the eyes, I saw you at the soiree. Yeah. It's yeah. Good no, to be in person with everyone. The NBOA put on a, just an excellent event. By the time this airs, this will be, you know, four to five weeks after the fact, but just amazing events, amazing group of people. Great time. The venue was awesome. We got lucky on the weather. I know NBA didn't choose the weather, but man, we got really lucky. It was a beautiful, beautiful summer night in a great location. You know, parking was was very convenient. Like what what a great, what a great night. And and we had a lot, we had a lot of fun time. We talked to a lot of people. You, you won a, a drill set uh in the Which I left there because I went to the bar. So yeah, yeah. You 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 took it a whole nother level that night actually while I drove an hour home. But uh yeah, no, you won your drill set too there. So I was happy for you. Yeah, so the thank you to Triton Realty. I had their their card was the one that wanted for me. So Matt Fritzel will give you a shout out. But if anyone's interested, if you're looking to scale, like these are the type of people you need to be around. I know we give the MBOA a lot of credit and all the different umbrella organizations under there. But you know, when you want to start doing bigger buildings and talking to the people who are doing it, that's the group. That's the group here in Chicago. And it's so easy just to insert yourself by showing up to these events one after another and getting in the game. So again, I couldn't recommend it any higher to the people who are looking to scale. Yeah. Well, I think uh, like any organization, we join any group, the, the longer you can't just go to one meeting and, and, and leave and say, I didn't get value from it. I think for me personally, it's going to multiple events, multiple meetings, having them out to ours. We've had them out here, but the more you get to know these people, you're just building your network. And the more they see your face, the more uh, likely you're going to start having things to talk about uh, over and over again. So uh, like any networking group, uh, you have to put in a little time and and, and build those relationships. And I, I think uh, these events are getting more and more fun because we've done that over the last couple of years. So I, I always look forward to hanging out with them. Yeah. Like every major brokerage was a sponsor at that event. Like everyone who's selling <laughs> five unit to 200 unit buildings was there. Yeah. And that's who you want to be around. So what, all right. So moving on, what do we got for the uh, housing provider tip of the week here? We got an awesome show today. So I will, uh, I will go fast, but it kind of, uh, what, what, this kind of correlates with what we've talked about in the past and then what we're going to talk about today. But I heard a quote this week and it was, don't mistake brains for a bull market. A lot of people that are, a lot of people are listening right now. A lot of people that we've had on the show, uh, they haven't experienced a downturn. They haven't experienced a recession. And it, it's been really hard to lose money in the last five, six years. And it's been really uh, easy to cover up mistakes. So uh, the whole don't mistake brains for a bull market we all have a lot of wind at our back that's really helping us either cover mistakes or make money when maybe we shouldn't have sometimes. So uh, that, that's what I got. Good stuff. All right. We have a heavy hitter alert. Uh, for those who don't know, David Green is our most downloaded episode. And I think our guest today is going to give him a good run for his money. Uh, our guest today, coming out with this fifth book, Real Estate by the Numbers, you can pre-order it now. And it's a beast. I, I heard it's over 400 pages. Uh, he has flipped hundreds of homes. He's now in the syndication space. He's a partner with Bar Down Investments. He's an advisor and one of, if not the biggest contributor to Bigger Pockets. Previous host of the Bigger Pockets Bigger Business Podcast, someone who has provided a wealth of knowledge to investors everywhere. Without further ado, we are so pleased to have Jay Scott on the show. Jay, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, guys. And yes, we are, we're going we're gonna to surpass David Green. I can't let him win anything. No, absolutely. Let's do this. So <laughs> this episode, we you have lived through multiple recessions. You, you've you covered a ton of like articles and blogs on inflation and economic factors. And we're going to jump into that. But before that, you've been successful in multiple areas of real estate investment. And we're not going to cover your whole story. Most of our listeners probably already know who you are. But you've just done a lot of pivots. You started you know, with flipping a 70-style ranch. You've done hundreds of flips, short sales, spec homes, ground up, now multifamily. Talk to us a little about the mindset of identifying the right strategy and the right timing to make these moves and balancing that between you know the shiny object syndrome, right? Jumping too quickly. Yeah. So I, it's funny. This is a topic that I, I'm near, to dear, near and dear to my heart, but I don't write about it nearly enough. Um, but I am a big fan of being able to pivot. I found that over the years, um, the most successful investors I've met are the ones that 
are flexible. The ones that aren't just fo so focused on their business today that they ignore what they're going to be doing three months, six months, two years from now, because the market's always going to change. And what's working today in one area isn't going to be what's working tomorrow in the same area. Or if you want to expand to new areas, it's not going to be what's working in the new area. And so the best investors out there are the ones that, yeah, you have to focus on your business today. You have to be the best at whatever you're doing, but you also have to spend some time thinking about where is the market headed and where is your business headed and where is the industry headed? And so over the years, I'm, I'm not a big fan of saying, okay, let's do something today. And then tomorrow we're going to pick up and we're going to do something completely different. Basically every pivot that I've made has been taking the skills that I learned previously and applying them in some way to a new area. So just to, to put some specifics behind it. So 2008, I started flipping houses. And in 2008, it was really easy to find houses. I mean, there were so many foreclosures. I was in Atlanta. Literally, I could throw a dart at the MLS and whatever it hit was probably going to be a pretty good deal. Um, and so from 2008 to 2010-ish, 11-ish, uh, all we bought were foreclosures. My first 150 houses were foreclosures that we bought right off the MLS. Uh, 2010, I started to notice that for the first time, there was some competition. And I know anybody that was investing before 2008 probably remembers that. But after 2008, I mean, literally in my county, there might have been three of us that were investing. So I had no competition. 2010, I started to notice that there was some competition. I started to recognize that it was harder to get stuff off the MLS because there were a whole bunch of us competing for these deals on the MLS and prices were starting to go up. And so I realized that, okay, I need to figure out another acquisition strategy. And so I started reading and studying and I learned all about this idea of off-market deal finding. Um, and so going out to directly to, to sellers, either through bandit signs, through direct mail, uh, through cold calling, through door knocking, whatever it was. And I also started to notice in 2010, just looking at the data, um, that we still had a decent number of foreclosures, but as foreclosures were coming down, short sales were going up. And so that kind of set off two things in my mind. Number one, it's going to be harder to get deals in the next couple of years. So I have to learn how to do off-market deal finding. And number two, there's not going to be as many foreclosures. So I'm going to have to find another niche, another type of, of deal that I'm, I'm going to be looking for. So in 2010, we kind of pivoted and said, okay, we're still going to keep flipping houses, um, but now we're going to start going to off-market uh, acquisition strategies. And now we're going to focus on short sales. And for like three years, all we did was short sales. Uh, that's not true. We did some foreclosures, but the bulk of what we were doing was, 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 was short sales. And the bulk of what we were doing was direct mail. And so for three years, again, things were really easy. Nobody else was doing direct mail. Nobody else was going after short sales because it was kind of a complicated strategy. Um, so for three years, we had it easy. Just like the previous three years, we had it easy just doing foreclosures off the MLS. 2013, started to see a little bit of competition again. And I started to recognize that, okay, maybe we need to, to start rethinking exactly what it is that we're going to be doing for the next couple of years. So 2013, I started to notice that everybody was kind of competing for the same deals. Lots of people were doing off-market strategies. Lots of people were doing flips. But that's when I started to notice that, um, that some of the, the leading investors, those that I kind of looked up to and were following, had started doing this thing called ground up infill construction. Basically, they were buying single family houses that were dilapidated, knocking them down and rebuilding them from scratch. And these days, everybody's kind of building ground up. But back then, nobody was doing it. Um, and so I said, OK, well, here's a new niche. Um, I can still go after. I can still use all of my strategies from foreclosures and short sales and, and acquisition strategies to find deals. But now I can go after these deals that nobody else are going after. And these are those things that are really dilapidated that literally need to be knocked down and rebuilt. So 2013, we bought our first infill new construction project. and We started building ground up. And for the next two or three years, basically, we focused on infill new construction. And again, nobody else was doing it at that time. We were a couple years ahead of everybody. 2015, 16 comes around. Everybody starts buying single family houses to knock down and rebuild. So as I see more competition coming into that space, I think, okay, what's next? And ultimately, um, basically, my goal was always to try and stay a year or two ahead. Um, I don't want to be completely on the, on the, 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 the edge um, because then there's probably not a lot of opportunity. But I also don't want to be back with the pack. Uh, because then I'm competing. So I always try and be just a little bit ahead of everybody else. Um, and I always kind of look to other investors that that I consider to be kind of on the leading edge to see what they're focused on. 
and then I might stay six, six months behind them. I let them kind of figure out all the all the the new tactics and all the new strategies and and follow what they're doing. And then six months later, after they've kind of gotten it all figured out, I just copy them. And so for me, copying what other people are doing, smart people are doing, has kind of been my my mantra. 2017, I started to realize that uh, that I felt like uh, we had a recession coming. Obviously, I was off by a couple of years. Um, may even been off by five years. I mean, I don't know if you want to even consider 2020 a recession, um, but I felt like, hey, the market's going to change. Where do I want to be when the market changes? And I decided multifamily is the place I wanted to be when the market changed. And I knew that it was going to take me a year or two to really learn the multifamily space, to build up my network of investors, uh, to build up my network of brokers that I'd be getting deal flow from. And so 2017, I said, okay, by 2020, I want to be fully entrenched in multifamily. So I started making that transition in 2017. By 2019, I found a multifamily operator that that I was friends with. She kind of taught me the business, brought me into her company. We ended up becoming partners. Here we are in 2022. We've been partners for a couple of years. Um, We're kind of going strong in multifamily. And now I'm starting to see everybody kind of getting into multifamily these days. Um, And so we need to continue to stay kind of on the leading leading edge there. Um, And so for anybody out there, I I highly encourage you. I know that was a, a long way of saying it, but I highly encourage you to kind of always be thinking about not only being the best at what you're doing today, but thinking about what you need to be doing tomorrow to stay a step or two ahead of everybody else and getting really good at that because then you can stay a step or two ahead and keep moving, keep pivoting. And and yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong with pivoting. It's a good thing. That's awesome. So we got a lot to unpack there. Uh, first off, full, fully agree. I, I can't remember the exact phrase, but it's, you know, pioneers end up with arrows in their back. Right. Like let someone else, someone else be the first guy and then, and then go ahead and follow and see what works and, and learn from it and iterate, et cetera. So J- Jay, you mentioned, you mentioned recession. It's on everyone's mind. You have talked a lot about this and we're at a very interesting crossroads. Um, you've talked about the two threats that are almost at opposite ends of the spectrum. We have stagflation and we have a national debt crisis yep. and those two things do not go hand in hand. So can you first off for our listeners define stagflation and then talk about these two things that are at, at odds with each other and what has to give here. Yeah, I, I mean, these are two things in kind of a, 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 this big whole thing of the economy and what's going on. Um, but at the end of the day, I, th- I think these are two big, um, two big risks that we face moving forward. Uh, so everybody's probably aware that we have a lot of inflation in this country and things are really expensive. We printed a lot of money and we have devalued uh, the dollar to a large extent. Um, and so what the, what the Federal Reserve has had to do to kind of fight inflation, one of their big tools to fight inflation is raising interest rates. And the reason that works is because typically inflation is the result of too much demand, too many people with too much money buying too much stuff. And when, you buy, and when everybody wants to buy stuff, people that are selling stuff, they need to buy more equipment, more warehousing, more inventory, they have to hire more people just to keep up with all the demand. When they're spending all this money to like expand their businesses, that costs money. So they pass that cost on to the consumer by raising their prices. So there's a lot of things that factor into inflation, especially this time around. But let's just to make it really simple and nobody beat me up because this isn't technically true. But to keep it really simple, let's just say that heavy demand um, leads to price inflation. So um, if heavy demand leads to price inflation, how do we reduce price inflation? Well, the big thing that the government likes to do is they like to reduce demand. And they do that by raising interest rates. And raising interest rates does two things. Number one, it encourages people to save more money because when interest rates are higher, savings account rates are higher, checking account rates are higher, CV rates are higher. You can save more money and and compound your interest. Um, So people save more money. Number two, it costs more to buy stuff. When interest rates are high, it costs more to buy a car, it costs more to buy a house, it costs more to put things on a credit card if you're not going to pay it off. And so people spend less money. And so between the combination of saving more money and spending less money, demand drops. And when demand drops, businesses don't have to hire as many people and they don't have to buy as much equipment and they don't have to buy as much warehousing space and they don't have to buy as much inventory. And so they're saving money and and there's less demand for their products. And so they start to drop their prices or at least they stop raising their prices. So raising interest rates is this thing that kind of reduces inflation. And so when we have high inflation, the first thing that the the Federal Reserve is going to do is it's going to raise interest rates. The thought is, the conventional thinking is, that you typically need to raise interest rates at least as high as inflation to get inflation to come down. Now, 
In reality, if we're seeing inflation now, like we are at 8%, 9%, it's actually probably higher than that, but let's go with the government's number of, of eight or 9%. Um, some people might be thinking, okay, does that mean we need to raise interest rates to eight or 9%? In reality, no, because as we start raising it, in, interest rates, uh, inflation is going to come down. Interest rates go up, inflation down, interest rates up, inflation down, and eventually they're going to meet somewhere in the middle. Now, the question is, where is that in the middle? Is it 3% interest rates? Is it 5% interest rates? Is it 7% interest rates? We don't know. And so what the Federal Reserve is doing at this point is they're slowly raising interest rates, hoping that inflation will come down and hoping that we can figure out where that middle point is. And then if we raise rates a little bit higher than that, that should push inflation down. But we don't know where that middle point is. So that's what brings us kind of to this dilemma. Um, when you raise rates slowly and you bring inflation down slowly, you run this risk of slowing the economy down in a way that... Um, that's not drastic enough. If we just raised rates to 15% right now, like back in the, in the early 80s when we saw massive inflation from the 70s, Federal Reserve literally raised rates to 20%. And that just quashed inflation right away. Um, and we saw a big recession and everything was bad for a while, but then got back on track. And so one strategy is you just raise rates really quickly, you purposely cause a recession, everything crashes, and then we get back on track. The other way to do it is that you raise rates slowly and you kind of step at a time and you hope to bring inflation down a little bit. But the problem is um, if that doesn't go as planned, you run this risk of getting into this downward spiral where rates are going up, rates are high, inflation's coming down, but inflation's still high. So now you have high rates and high inflation. And you basically get in the situation where um, where you have high inflation, but you also have essentially a recession. So people have stopped spending money and, and people like businesses aren't doing well. So businesses start laying people off. Employment, unemployment goes up. And basically the economy goes into the tank. Everything's bad, but we still have high inflation. And the situation where you have high inflation along with a bad economy, that's what we call stagflation. It's kind of the worst of both worlds. Inflation's bad, but if you have a good economy along with it, not, not horrible. Um, if you have low inflation and a bad economy, not good, but not horrible. When you have a bad economy and high inflation, that's really bad. And that's what we call stagflation. So, um, so a lot of people say, okay, well, if the risk is stagflation, the reason why I don't like stagflation is because again, you can, it gets into a spiral that can take years or decades to get out of. It's not easy to get out of a stagflationary environment. It's easy to get out of inflation by just hiking rates really quick. But stagflation is one of these problems that economists haven't really been able to figure out how to solve quickly and easily. So one risk we have now is um, we raise rates slowly and potentially we get into this downward spiral. So people are saying, well, let's raise rates a little bit faster. Let's raise rates to six, seven, eight percent. That'll quash inflation really quickly. Yeah, we'll have a recession, but in a year or two, we'll like we'll, we'll be out of it. The problem with raising rates quickly is when you raise rates, these aren't just rates that apply. Interest rates don't just apply to us as consumers. They apply to the government as well. When the government prints money, when the government um, uh, issues debt in the form of treasury bills and treasury bonds, they need to pay interest on those. I mean, we all hear this idea of bonds, people buying bonds, governments buying bonds, businesses buying bonds. Um, you pay interest on bonds. And so if the government prints a trillion dollars and uses that to raise money, let's say from China, they issue a trillion dollars in bonds to China, China's going to expect to pay, be paid interest on buying those bonds. And that interest is at whatever the rate, the interest rates are. And so if we raise rates to 7%, all of this debt that the US has created, they're now going to have to start paying interest on that debt at 7%. And we can't afford to do that. We already have too much debt. And if we have to pay 7% interest on, on all the new interest that, that we, we, we create, um, what we're going to find is that we need to print money just to pay our interest. And then we get into this other spiral, this snowball, where you're printing money to pay the interest, and now you're, you have to pay interest on that money, and interest on that money, and interest on that money. So we're kind of coming into the situation where we have two choices. We can raise interest rates slowly to kill inflation. We run the risk of, of stagflation. Or we can raise rates quickly to kill inflation, and we run the risk of getting into this debt spiral where we just we have to print money to pay off, off all our debt. And so there's really no good solution for the Federal Reserve right now. They're going after the first. They're going after the raise rates slowly. And hopefully we won't get into this stagflation situation. Um, so far, we haven't. But we won't know probably for another 6 to 12 months uh, what's going to happen. Is, is inflation going to come down? Is it not going to come down? 
came down a little bit last month, but uh, but not a lot. So we, we just don't know at this point. How does that affect, you know, so back 2008, uh, you just know no one was lending. You didn't have private lenders. You'd have these yep. mid-tier lenders. Banks were, were closing. Like it, the, the government pumped in just as much, if not more money into everything in 2008 than they did now. But they obviously they went to the banks and it's a different type of, most of it's still been the banks. But to me, it seems like nothing can slow down until the ability to get money uh, and the real estate world. Um, it seems like there's always just so much more money and they're adjusting really quickly. It's affecting some of the sellers cap rates, but how does like lending and all that have to look like in the next couple of years as, as how free it is right now? Yeah. So, uh, well, you, you hit the nail on the head with like um, how the money was released in 2008 versus now. And that's the reason we're seeing a lot of inflation now in 2008, basically the government said, okay, we need to release. It was something like $4 trillion into the economy. And the way they did it is they gave $4 trillion to the banks and they told the banks go lend more money. In reality, the banks didn't lend, they couldn't lend $4 trillion. There weren't $4 trillion worth of worthy borrowers out there. So the banks lent a trillion, trillion and a half, trillion and three quarters, and they left $2 trillion in their reserves. And so we didn't really see $4 trillion, even though we issued $4 trillion in stimulus, we didn't see $4 trillion come into the economy. And the money that did come into the economy went very strategically to, to worthy borrowers who basically went to the bank and said, I can prove that I can pay this back. That's different from 2020 and 2020 and from 2020 to now, it's actually been closer to $9 trillion. So we've actually released twice as much this time around than last time. Um, but more importantly, um, instead of giving that money to the banks and saying, hey, lend more money, control the, 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 the flow of money into the economy. Instead, what the government did was they said, and rightfully so, because 2020 was a really bad time and people were starving and, and couldn't work. Um, they said, instead of going through the banks, we're just going to start sending checks to people. And we're going to start giving out PPP loans to businesses that they don't have to pay back and EIDL loans that, that businesses don't have to pay back. And we're going to bail out the, the cruise industry and we're going to bail out the airline industry. And we just started handing out all this money, not through banks. We just handed it out. And so this money kind of, I, I've used the analogy, it's like, um, like taking drugs. Um, you, 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 you go into a doctor's office for surgery and they stick the mask over your face and you breathe in the anesthetic. Um, and that kind of slowly gets into your body. That was 2008 versus the guy that's doing heroin and, and injecting uh, heroin directly into his veins. That was 2020. That gets into your system a lot faster. Um, you don't have to wait for that. And that's what happened in 2020. We eject, injected this cash right into the, the, the heart and veins of the, of the economy. Like, and, and so all that money, where did it go? It went someplace. It went ultimately into assets. That money flowed from people that needed it um, for to pay for their food and their clothes and their everyday items um, into businesses. And then the businesses got this money, and that went to the owners of the businesses. And the owners of the businesses had this money, and they started buying real estate and crypto and stocks. And basically, we just saw this tremendous asset inflation. And so that's why we are seeing a lot more inflation now than we did in 2008. It's not that we printed, well, we did print a lot more money but it's more the way we release the money into the system. Now that didn't answer your question. Um, that was just, that, that this was a great analogy though. Saying, yeah, this, this is, this is the reason <laughs> we have a bigger issue today than we did 10 years ago. I get that question a lot. Like, didn't we print a lot of money back then? Why didn't we see a lot of inflation for the last 10 years? Well, that's the reason. Um, but in terms of lending, yeah, I, I think what we're going to see is, and when we see this in a, in a lot of recessions, I don't think we're going to have a 2008 type event. I don't think we're going to see a crash um, if we do see a major downturn, I don't think real estate's going to get hit nearly as bad this time as it did in 2008. If you look back over the last 160 years, this will be our 35th recession in the last 160 years. That means if you do the division, 160 divided by 35, there's a recession every five years. We see a lot of recessions. 99% of them or some vast majority of them, I, think, I can only think of two where real estate got hit really hard. That was the Great Depression and the Great Recession in 2008. 33 of the 35 recessions or 32 out of the 34 recessions that we've seen till now, um, real estate hasn't gotten hit that hard. Maybe it's gotten hit a little bit, but it it's not, wasn't like 2008. So just statistically, what we've seen throughout history in this country, the next recession is probably not going to hit real estate that hard. But what we do tend to see is we do tend to see uh, lending tighten up. We see credit tighten up. And this is often what leads to, to a, a 
bigger downturn in the economy in general. People have trouble borrowing money so that they can pay their mortgage or, or um, buy stuff on their credit cards. People have lots of debt. I mean, that's no, no secret. And so people are relying on credit. They're relying on debt to continue to live. Basically, um, it's this pyramid scheme that we all kind of build up in our families where, um, where we have lots of debt and to pay our mortgage or to buy clothes or to buy food next month, we need more debt. And when lenders say, hey, we're not making debt easy to get, or we're only allowing debt to go to people that are credit worthy, um, lots of people start to fail. Lots of families start to fail. Lots of small businesses start to fail. And what we see is we see people claim bankruptcy. We see businesses claim bankruptcy. We see people go into foreclosures. And basically what's happening is all this debt that people are created is it's vanishing. If I foreclose on my house, that $300,000 in debt I might have on my mortgage goes away. I mean, it doesn't really go away. The bank eats it, but it goes away. Um, if I claim bankruptcy, that $100,000 somebody might have on their credit card, that kind of goes away. Again, it doesn't go away, but the, the credit card company eats it. But we have all this debt that if you look at a chart that shows we have $14 trillion in consumer debt right now during a recession, because people are declaring bankruptcy and businesses are going out of businesses and things are getting foreclosed on, that $14 trillion in debt drops to $8 trillion or $7 trillion or $9 trillion. And basically, we've sort of reset the economy. And this is what a recession is. It's basically a reset in the debt of the economy um, so that we can start again. And then in five or six or eight years, after we've built up all that debt again, we can do the same thing again. It sounds messed up when you word it that way. <laughs> it yeah, sounds like irresponsible. I mean, it, it, and, and so, it, well, it's funny. We, we call it the business cycle or the economic cycle. Um, but economists call it the debt cycle because that's really what it is. That's what leads us into a recession. The fact that that everybody's just living off of credit, including not just people, but businesses. Everybody's living off of credit. And we get to the point where we've built up so much credit that it's unsustainable. Um, and we need an event that kind of disposes of all of that, that bad debt and bad credit and, and uh, basically resets so that people are, in, are, are, are back in decent financial situations again. So that's essentially what our, our economic cycle is. It's, it's just that debt going up and down. Yep. So Jay, you, you mentioned you don't feel this is going to be like 08 if, if we do have any sort of downturn here. And I, I, I agree with that historical perspective. However, like a lot of our listeners, or a lot of people in real estate now only have 08 as a reference point. Yep. Do you see any truth to be, maybe, maybe you're right. Historically, this shouldn't be that bad, but because everyone has 08 on their mind and humans are not rational creatures, we turn this into something worse than it is. Like, do you feel like there could be like that hysteria because that's, we turn it into something that was, all right, this is, this kind of sucks to, oh my God, this is terrible. Yeah, well, that's something that's, that economists talk about a lot, is that economic cycles are, are more self-fulfilling prophecy than anything else. Um, it, it's If people think that the economy is going downhill, they're going to start acting differently. They're going to stop spending money. They're going to start saving and hoarding money. They're going to start buying less stuff or cheaper stuff. Um, they're going to start living off of less. And ultimately, that's going to slow down the economy because people are spending money. What is our economy? Our economy, we have the, we talk about this thing called GDP, gross domestic product, which is basically the total output of the economy. And we literally measure the health of the economy by GDP. We want it to keep growing. We want the, the, the total output of this economy to expand. And when people stop spending and start saving more, that slows down the economy. And so if people think we're heading towards a recession, they're going to do something that's going to cause us to head towards a recession. Um, and even more so than people doing that, we, we often talk about like people kind of leading a recession. And when recessions happen, th bad things happen to people. And, but for the most part, businesses are the thing that lead the, the economic cycle. And it's less what people are doing, it's more what businesses are doing. If you want to know where the economy is headed, don't take a, a poll of random Americans where you think the economy is headed. Take a poll of CEOs. And if CEOs tell you they think things are going to be bad, things are going to be bad because who spends the most money in this country? Businesses. And if CEOs think we're headed towards a recession, they're going to stop spending money. They're going to stop buying equipment. They're going to stop buying inventory. They're going to stop hiring. They're going to do all these things that are going to slow down the economy. And over the last few months, that's kind of been the biggest thing that stood out to me is that uh, CEOs are starting to get very wary of the economy. Um, it took longer than it took the, uh, the, the average American. The average American for the last six months has been concerned. But over the last month or two, CEOs are starting to get concerned. 
And that's what really scares me because again, when they stop spending money, when they think we're heading towards a downturn, well, they're actually going to cause it because, because they're, they're going to, their, their beliefs and actions are going to drive us further into that. So right now we have a, a, a tight job market, uh, CEOs cutting back expenses and probably new hires. Do you see any benefit in, in, in that where it could kind of average out, uh, the struggles people are having hiring people these days? So, I mean, the job market is one of those things that I have a feeling business schools are going to be doing like um, uh, analysis of what's going on in our job market today, 20 years from now. Um, I don't think anybody here really fully understands it. When I say anybody here, I mean anybody. I don't think anybody understands what's going on. We've got 3.5% unemployment, which is like the lowest, tied for the lowest in history. Um, We have very few people claiming unemployment every week. I mean, um, we, we don't seem to have a whole lot of people complaining about unemployment. At the same time, um, we have more open positions than we have people looking for work. Um, but in a lot of ways, it feels like we're, we're heading into a recession. So how do you reconcile those two things? And uh, the reality is that our, our job, um, what, what, the, what the job market looks like today has changed. So a lot of people now are working the gig economy. So people driving for Uber and DoorDash. Um, a lot of people who during the, the downturn were able to save a lot of money because there was stimulus and they weren't going out a lot and, and whatever. So they might have started day trading. And we all know the stock market went through the roof. So a lot of people may have made a lot of money off of, of the stock market and crypto during the downturn. Um, so there are a lot of people who maybe don't need to work for six months or a year because they, they're now flush compared to where they were a couple of years ago. Um, a lot of people getting second and third jobs. And yeah, we, we measure that, but not as closely. And we don't talk about that as much as we talk about that 3.5% unemployment number. There are a lot of people out there that are, that are working two jobs now or three jobs because their hours are getting cut or their wages are getting cut. Um, so in some ways, the job market looks really, really strong. In other ways, it looks kind of weak. Um, we also have this situation where with 2020, it's very likely that we had literally millions of people who were on the verge of retirement. They were going to retire in the next five years. Um, but instead of them retiring 20% this year, 20% next year for the five years, in 2020, when everything kind of went off a cliff, we now had 100% of those people decide to retire all at the same time. Um, and so now we have millions of people out of the workforce all at once when it would have been a few hundred thousand every year for five years. Um, and suddenly all of our data kind of goes out the window because um, we're not looking at apples to apples data anymore because we now have millions of people that we expected to be in the job force that are no longer in the job force. Um, and so all of this basically means that we don't really know what's going on with employment. And yeah, that 3.5 number looks really strong. There are other numbers that don't look as strong. And then two days ago, I read that, um, uh, I forget who took the poll, but there was some poll of CEOs that 50% of CEOs say they expect layoffs in the next six months. I mean, if 50% of businesses expect layoffs in the next six months, um, obviously our job numbers are not going to stay strong and our, our economic numbers are going to go down. So I think to me, that's kind of the biggest indicator um, I know everybody talks about GDP and the fact that we saw negative GDP two quarters in a row, and that means recession. I don't buy that. Um, but I think there's no arguing that if half the employers out there say they're getting ready to, to lay people off um, over the next six months, we're going to have a, a big economic uh, downturn uh, just if through, through unemployment and, and, and the business recession. Yeah, that, it's kind of nuts because it's, <laughs> it, there's another half people who can't find anyone to work. <laughs> Right. <laughs> like, I, I think the mismatch is that with inflation, um, the price of everything's going through the roof. Wages aren't keeping up. So we have inflation at eight or nine percent. We have wage growth at five percent. So people are still losing three percent of their spending power every year, even if they keep working. And so what people are doing is they're saying, I need better jobs. I need more money. So people are trying to get jobs that pay more relative to what they're worth than they were a couple of years ago because inflation is higher than wage growth. Um, and so everybody's kind of holding out for a better job. They're saying, yeah, three, four, five years ago, I might've been happy to take a job for $40,000 a year. Now I need a job for $60,000 a year. 
And there are plenty of jobs out there, but there aren't nearly as many $60,000 jobs as there are $40,000 jobs. And so I think that's the issue that we're seeing with too many, too many uh, open positions and not enough workers is that there's just a mismatch between the types of open positions, um, the pay for those open positions and the workers who are willing to take that particular salary. I think anyone that had the taste of working from home too, uh, if they're looking for something, they're definitely not going to be like, oh, let's go back to office five days a week for 10 hours a day. So yeah, I think and, that's the other struggle. Yeah. And, and then there's, and I'm making this up. I don't know, but I have to imagine there are a lot of people out there who, um, who were working and they had daycare and they had their kids in daycare. Um, and they never really did the math to realize that um, after you pay for daycare and you pay for the gas in your car and you pay for all the other things, that your job was basically just paying for your kids to be in daycare. Maybe you're making a little bit of money, but you, you get to the point where you get laid off from your job or your kids are no longer in school. So you have to stay home with them. And you realize I could have saved money by staying home with my kids and, and raising my kids. And so I think there are a lot of men and women out there who are like just realizing um, that putting their, their kids in daycare and getting a job is not necessarily the best financial decision. They can make just as much money by not paying for daycare and not paying to commute back and forth and not paying for lunches and not paying for, for the new clothes that they require for their jobs and just stay home with their kids. And now they have the same amount of money. Yep. So, so Jay, knowing all this information, are you still out there actively looking for deals? And if so, how has your underwriting changed? So yes, we are, we are always looking for deals. Um, I'm a big proponent that there's always some, something in real estate you can do that, that will be beneficial. Um, I even wrote a book on the topic called Recession Proof Real Estate Investing, um, which is all about the economic cycle and, and what you should be doing at different parts of the economic cycle to really maximize your profits and, and minimize your risk. And so during these times, again, one of the reasons that I moved into multifamily back in 2018, 19, um, was because I felt like we we're heading towards a recession. And I really like uh, multifamily investing during a recession for a number of reasons. And I, I won't go into those here, but um, I will say that right now, what I'm focused on is I'm focused on longer term holds. And when I say longer term, uh, relative to flipping. So I, I like three to five year holds at a minimum, because I do think that we are going to be in a recession. If we're not already, we will be in the next couple of months. Typically, recessions last no longer than 18 months. Typically, we have this run up to a recession where we raise interest rates, we get into a recession, um, and then the Federal Reserve realizes, ah, shit, we need to get out of that recession. Um, and to do that, they lower interest rates. Typically, that cycle from starting to raise interest rates to starting to lower interest rates is less than two years. So if you think they started raising interest rates six months ago, reasonable to assume that in the next 18 months, we're going to start lowering interest rates again. So even if the stock market, I'm sorry, even if the real estate market does take a hit over the next year, year and a half, I think within a year and a half, things are going to come back. So if you're buying property today um, and you can buy at a decent discount today because there's not a lot of demand or because sell, some sellers are more desperate um, and you can hold that property for the next two, three, four or five years, you're going to find that you've got some really good deals in your hands. So right now, what I encourage people to do is stay away from the transactional real estate. Don't flip houses. Um, I mean, if you're really good at it and, and you're, you're not very risk averse, okay, keep flipping houses. But the likelihood is that, that we're not going to see a lot of uh, value growth in real estate over the next year or two. So if you're flipping, you have to go back to the fundamentals. You really have to go back to being able to add value and not expect the market to add value. I see a lot of people who have flipped houses over the last couple of years who think they're geniuses. Um, because yeah, I made 40% on that flip. I made 70% on that flip. And, <laughs> and the, the reality, market was up 40%. <laughs> exactly. The reality was if the market hadn't gone up in that time, they would have broken even or lost money. They didn't do a good job, but they don't, they'll never realize that. Um, so unless you really know what you're doing, be cautious with flipping. Um, focus on the longer term buy and holds. Uh, don't buy anything now that you're going to have to refinance in a year or two, because like Mark said, um, one of the things we see during a recession is that lending tightens. It's going to be a lot harder to get a loan next year, most likely than it is this year. So if you have anything right now that you either are going to need to, to finance or you're going to need to refinance in the near future, do it now. Don't wait. Um, I would tell people if, uh, if, um, if you don't have good credit, well, now's the time to be working on your credit. Because let me tell you something, when lending does tighten, the people that are going to get the loans are the ones that have 740 and above credit scores. 
Um, I remember 2008 when literally you couldn't get a mortgage without a 740 credit score. Now it's down to like 620 or 580 or something. It's going to move back up. So work on your credit. Um, extend your credit lines. So if you have credit card, if you have a credit card right now with a limit of 20,000, call and ask them if you can increase it to 30,000. I'm not saying use that money. Don't use that money unless you really need it. But it's nice to have available if you find some amazing deal that you just can't finance any other way. It's nice to have that available. You own your personal residence and and uh, and and you have a lot of equity in it. Go get a HELOC. Again, don't take that money out. Don't don't pay interest on that money, but have it available because if in a year you can't get a loan but you find a great deal, you'll be glad you got that HELOC now and have that credit available. So there are strategies that you can be doing now, um, and there are a lot of strategies that I like, um, but most of them focus on at least midterm holds, and I'm not a fan of anything that that's highly transactional right now. Got it. So a common motif we've had here is, you know, all boats rise with the tide. Yep. Given that, now let's say you're, you're a passive investor and you're looking to invest. Everyone has won over the last five years, yep. right? Like it's very hard to lose money in any sort of three to five year exit that started in 18, right? Yep. So, so as someone who's looking at that and looking at past success, how, what would you say to someone looking to judge an operator, right? Like how, how do you judge it? Because everyone's been a winner. Yeah. I would say definitely look for the, the people that know the economy and have written books on the economy. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but but, but to, to some degree, uh, yeah, you want people who have lived through multiple recessions. Um, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I'm partial but because I invest passively with other people. Um, I, I like the older investors. Um, and so um, I, I'm an old guy, I'm 50, but, but I, like, I, I want to invest with the 60 and 70 year old investors because they've, they've gone through the cycle a lot more than I have. Um, I want the ones that, are, that tend to be conservative. Um, I want the ones that, um, that will show me their underwriting um, because literally um, I will look at other people's underwriting and I will pick it apart. Um, people talk about, we talk about passive investing and yeah, there is a such thing as passive investing, but it only becomes passive after you make the decision to invest. And I encourage everybody to really understand whatever it is you're investing in really well, so that between the time you think about investing and you decide to invest, you can really do your due diligence. Um, what I'll do with a lot of our investors is, even if they don't ask for it, I'll say, let's sit down and walk through the underwriting. underwriting. I want you to have an idea of how multifamily underwriting works um, so that whether you invest with me or somebody else, you can make better decisions. Um, so don't be scared to like whoever you're going to invest with say, hey, walk me through the underwriting. Tell me why you've been conservative. Where are all these areas that you've been conservative? Um, because the good operators are the ones that will say, yeah, we didn't factor this in, but it can help us. We didn't factor this in, but it could help us. We didn't factor this in, but it, it could help us. Um, because you, you want kind of all of those um, those stop gaps to kind of add up. And, and if things go down the, down the tubes, down the toilet, um, you have potential things that can help you. Um, so yeah, so I, I prefer those who have been doing this for more than at least one cycle. Um, I tend to prefer the older investors. I want the investors who are investing um, that, that are willing to be transparent about their, their operations and transparent about their underwriting. Um, I always look for in, uh, operators who are, who are very good with their communication. Um, that to me is a big thing. So I, I realize that some deals don't always go well. Well, I want to know that on day one. I don't want to find that out the day that you call me up and say, I lost all your money. Um, so good communication is, is really important to me. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's a tough question. Um, because um, I, there are plenty of people that kind of go against that grain. I'm sure there are plenty of young investors out there who are great. Um, I don't mean to disparage young investors. Um, there are plenty of investors out there that probably don't communicate well, but will take care of your money. And so it, it's, it's really hard, but those are sort of the things I look for because those are the things that help me sleep better at night. Awesome. Talking about people that experience it reminds me of uh, Keith, Hunting, Keith Cunningham, The Road Less Stupid. That's one of my yeah. favorite books. And it's on my bookshelf. Oh. Yep. A lot of what he references is that 1980s uh, downturn that he lost a lot of money in, and, and that, that he just has that old, uh, that, that old, uh, that experience that's like most other people don't have, or most others that all of us are not learning from right now. So good book. Check it out. I, one, one of my favorite uh, questions to ask an operator is tell me, tell me the most money you've ever lost on a deal. And what I've noticed is 
a few years ago, everybody liked to say, oh, I've never lost money on a deal. And, and people are starting to realize that's not the right answer anymore because um, I want to hear somebody that, I want to hear the people that to, in 2008 did a syndication and lost every penny. Um, because I want to know that they hopefully learn from that mistake. And as, as much as that sucks for their investors back then, um, it's going to benefit their investors moving forward. If they're still in the game after losing a lot of money in 2008, they probably learned some lessons. Um, and so that's, that's, I want to hear about, I want to hear from the people that lost a lot of money. And it, it's going back to the book. It ties in. It's, anyone who thinks it's easy is stupid, right? Or whatever the quote exactly. is. <laughs> it's just. Exactly. All right. Awesome. Before we wrap, just want to ask uh, one more question because a lot of what everyone else learns from is other people's mistakes. Any, any mistakes you made or any things you do over that you can share with our audience that can potentially help them avoid those mistakes? Yeah. I've just been flawless the last two decades. Yeah. Um, uh, (laughs) No, I've lost lots of money. So invest with me. No. um, (laughs) So I've been, I've been fortunate. Um, I started at the perfect time. I started in the middle of 2008 when the market had already crashed and so it was hard for me to make too many mistakes between 2008 and 2000 today. Um, it, like, yeah, I've, I've been tremendously fortunate. I, I'd like to think um, that I've always focused on the fundamentals. And so, but, but I've, we all make tons of mistakes. Um, I just like to think of mine as kind of smaller mistakes. So I've, I've been fortunate in that sense. But the biggest mistake I'd say I ever made, um, and I talk about this a lot, is um, I, I never appreciated the idea of buy and hold. Or I shouldn't say I never. It took me ten years to appreciate the idea of buy and hold. Um, over my career, I think we've we've flipped and sold three, four, four hundred and fifty houses. Um, and I look back and I realize that if I would have kept a third of those, my net worth would be twenty million dollars higher right now. Um, you don't realize that the value in real estate is that one. It, so you do get some natural appreciation. I, I'm not a big fan of natural appreciation. And you know, over the last hundred years. Um, real estate has uh, appreciated on average about the pace of inflation. So you don't make a ton of money just holding real estate just from it appreciating, but you get benefit from, you get cash flow every year. You do have forced appreciation. All of us, well, not all of us, but many of us will take our properties and we'll improve them. And so we can increase the value just through doing smart renovations. Uh, We can increase the rent through doing smart renovations. Plus we get the tax benefits. And I think a lot of younger people, me, up until the last few years, I never appreciated the tax benefits of my real estate. But I think if, if younger people started thinking more about the tax benefits, they'd realize that over the course of 10 or 20 or 30 years, you can literally make millions of dollars just by being smart with taxes. And then the biggest benefit with real estate is just this idea of we can use leverage. I can get a loan today and my tenants can pay down that loan. And literally, I'm making six, four, five, six, seven percent per year in it's not cash flow because I'm not actually getting the cash, but equity buildup, which is almost as good as cash flow because I can get it as soon as I sell or refinance. Like I'm making five, six, seven percent per year just in my tenants paying down the principal on my on my loan. And so we look at the stock market and you see the stock market's making eight percent um, over time. My real estate makes five, six, seven percent just through loan pay down. You add on the tax benefits, you add on the appreciation, you add on the um, um, the cash flow, and it's really easy for 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 your real estate to make 12, 13, 14, 15 percent. And so what I recommend people think about is don't just think about the cash flow. Um, think about all the different aspects of making money in real estate and consider that if you're going to flip houses, um, if you're going to buy four, flip three and hold one. Um, because the real value in real estate is, is that paying down of your, your principal over time, building equity. Um, we don't want to be working 20 years from now, most of us. And so um, the way to avoid that is, is if you have to flip, hold a couple. Um, and if you don't have to flip, then hold every, every one you buy, um, because that's, that's what's really going to make you money long term. And I, I wish I would have realized that 10 years sooner. Yeah, and, and to the whole point of what we were talking about today, that, that 30 year fix you have um, or that long term debt. No matter what inflation is doing right now, as long as you have fixed, uh, that, that's that's not going up. Your, your mortgage will stay the same. So that, that's a way to protect that as well, too. Yeah. A year ago, I, I wrote a post on Facebook basically telling people the, the house is no longer the asset. The loan's the asset. Yeah. Um, and I would take out a 30-year fixed loan on basically anything. I it, if you could Give me a 30-year fixed on my dog. I take out a 30-year fixed on my dog. It's really, it's, it's the loan that I'm paying down in inflated dollars. 
um, that's the real asset, even if the underlying asset, the house, isn't going up in value. The, the loan is still hedging inflation and beating inflation. Before we do wrap up, I got one more thing. I heard on a recent podcast you did, and I want the listeners to hear this, maybe you can comment on it. But a lot of people that are, are buying for add value or, or planning on increasing rents, they're not calculate, they're 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 not, they definitely build in the rent increase, but they're not building in the expense increase. And uh, I just if you could just touch a second for that of how people are really missing that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially in the multifamily world, um, this is a big thing because at the end of the day, the value of your multifamily, the value of any commercial piece of commercial real estate is going to be in its, its net operating income, the amount of money it pulls in. Um, and we all think about the fact that rents are going through the roof and we're going to be making more money next year than last year. Um, but we often forget that, that there are expenses that go along with that. And if rents are going up five, six, seven percent, most likely um, our insurance is going to go up more than normal and our taxes are going to go up more than normal and our maintenance costs are going to go up more than normal and our advertising and marketing costs for tenants are going to go up more than normal. Our property management costs might go up more than normal. And so I see so many, I, I mentioned earlier that I like to dig into the underwriting of deals that I invest in. So often I'll see uh, uh, an operator underwrite 5% rent increases for next year and two or 3% expense increases. Well, First of all, I think 5% rent increases, yeah, we may have seen that the last couple of years, but that's not going to continue forever. Um, so I don't like that number, but I certainly don't like the 2 or 3% expense increases when we have inflation at 8 or 9%. Um, so if, if your expenses aren't, if, if in your underwriting, your expenses aren't increasing at least the rate of your rents, um, you're probably not being conservative enough. Great advice. Mark, let's take this to wrap. All right. We have... Uh... Six questions for you that uh, let's do it that you can do. So, what is your competitive advantage as an investor? Have you been able to do this? Do so much in ten years? Um, I am an engineer by education and mindset, and so I I think I've done a pretty good job of taking the, the emotion out of it and really just being able to look at the numbers and and understand the numbers behind investing. And so uh, for me, it's it's just I I, I do this very unemotionally. Jay, what's one piece of advice you would tell someone that has yet to buy their first property? Um, don't give up. So the, the biggest truism I found in real estate, there are no secrets in this business, um, but the closest I've gotten to a secret is um, I meet two types of people. Um, one, I meet a whole bunch of people that have never done a deal. Um, 95% of the people I meet want to do a deal, have never done a deal. The other 5% of people that I meet have done three, five, 10, 50 deals. There's one type of person I never meet in this business, and that's somebody that's done one deal. Nobody does one deal. Because if you can do that one deal, if you can get yourself in the 5% that does at least one deal, then you're going to do three, five, 10, 50, 100 deals. So what I tell people is don't give up until you get that one deal. And then if you want to give up after one, go for it. But nobody will. That's so true. It's almost a tie back to our heroin comment earlier. <laughs> 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 awesome. Awesome. What, what do you do for fun? Uh, what do I do for fun? I have two kids and a puppy. So um, basically I don't have fun. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so uh, certainly uh, my family I spent a lot of time with family, um, but I used to be a semi-professional poker player, um, something few people know about me. Um, and so when I get the chance, I like to go out, a uh, few friends and I go out to the world series of poker every year and play the world series of poker and try and get to, to Vegas a couple times a year. So that's kind of my, uh, my, my, uh, secret hobby. Nice. Love it. What kind of dog? Uh, we just got an, uh, English cream, golden retriever. So a white golden retriever. Oh, Ooh, nice. Yeah, sweet little girl. All right. So you can't say your own books and we'll give you a second to plug those. Oh, but yeah. besides yourself, what is a, besides your own books, what is a good book podcast or self-development activity that you would recommend to our listeners? Yeah, I'm going to recommend a book. Uh, it's called The Goal, G-O-A-L. Um, and it's basically, um, it, it was written back in the 80s, I think. Um, but it's all about basically why systems and processes are important and how to clear roadblocks out of your business. And it talks essentially about building an efficient business um, that, that knows how to clear, clear the roadblocks that keep you from growing. Um, and it's a book that for some reason, nobody seems to know about, but it's one of my favorite books. Uh, oh, it's a, it's a super book. easy read because it's, I love it's a, a fable. So it's a, it's a story. Fable. It's of, just a story. 
Yeah, it's it's a great book. Um, and the whole you know, us try to undercover, uncover process and stuff like that. Great book, easy read, but yeah, just trying to break down uh systems, especially for it's a great for flippers or, or rehabbers or ground up build. Like it, it just helps you just kind of understand how to take out roadblocks. Awesome book. Yeah. All right. Besides yourself, name one person you you would recommend to our investors as a quality resource? Maybe it's someone to follow. Maybe it's someone on bigger pockets. Uh, someone here. Yeah. I'm going to go with my, uh, my business partner, Ashley Wilson. Um, so she has been doing multifamily for a really long time. Um, I'm, I'm really good on the number side. I'm kind of the fundraiser. I'm the, I'm the, the underwriter guy. She knows more about asset management. When we, when we use the term asset management, that's basically managing the property, managing the business plan for large properties, more so than pretty much anybody I've ever met. And she talks a lot about that on, on other people's podcasts. And, and she's hired by a lot of companies that people would probably have heard of uh, to help them with their asset management. Um, so for anybody out there, especially if you're doing commercial or multifamily that want to get really good on the asset management side of things, um, Ashley is, is probably the best resource I've ever met. We'll, and we'll make sure to link to her in the show notes. Jay, thank you so much. You provide a ton of value to our listeners. How can they learn more about you? Give us some info on the upcoming book or some of the books you've already written. And is there any other way they can provide value to you? No, I appreciate that. So um, yeah, I do have a new book out that I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to mention. Um, it's called Real Estate by the Numbers. Um, if I retitled it, I'd probably call, call it Thinking Like an Investor because the book is really all about um, all the math and concepts and strategy and, um, and, and important stuff that goes into investing um, and really thinking like a seasoned investor um, and understanding all the, all the important concepts in investing. And the book is pre-order now. It'll be out in October. But anybody that, that wants to learn more to pre-order it, uh, you can go to numbersbook.com, numbersbook.com. And anybody that wants to reach out to me, um, you can learn more about me and get linked out to everything or contact me if you go to www.connectwithjscott.com. So numbersbook.com and connectwithjscott.com and that'll get you everywhere you need to go. Great. And we will link to that all in the show notes. Awesome. Mark, Appreciate it. You, ready, you ready to get this one right? Yes. Yes. Who, who are we playing for? Julie something. Julie something out of LaGrange. We got a bunch of LaGrange people here. So, All right. So I made this one a little easier. So our, our guest today, you know, flipped probably a couple hundred homes in the Atlanta, Georgia area. I was trying to find a way to tie that in Chicago. So Mark, let's see if you know your geography. What is the least amount of states you're driving your car? What is the least amount of states you can travel through from Atlanta, Georgia, to Chicago, Illinois? Where you go, Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois. That's how you do it. You can skip Indiana though. You can? Kentucky touches Illinois. Oh, yeah, I guess it does. But that's the fastest route, though, because I have driven that from uh, from Atlanta to, to Well, the Chicago. question was the least amount of states. Oh, yeah. yeah Try to give you a layup. I was, but it's it's the process, the efficiency of like going a straight line. Like I, I, <laughs> no roadblocks. Like I could. I, I could have made this easy. I've also flipped fifty houses in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So how many? Oh, how many, how, how many states from Milwaukee to uh, to Chicago? We know that. That's easy. <laughs> Probably use some <laughs> Chicago crews. But then it's a trick. Is it? Do you count Wisconsin and Illinois? Do you not count? Oh, that's them? a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> zero. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Um, we'll actually, we'll, we'll let uh, her, her win the, uh, the, the gift ticket there. So we won't hold it back because- uh, That's Renovo's money. Who cares? Yeah, yeah. It's a sponsor of mine. So we're good. We're good. <laughs> Jay, awesome show. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you as always. Listeners, we're going to link on our, our website to get uh, Jay's books, uh, the new one coming out and his old ones as well too. So check that out. Check out other resources, our networking page for all the local meetups that we uh, we actually modified this week. So check that out for anything new. Uh, and, and we added a handful in there as well too. But uh, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Tom. And listeners, we'll see you next week. Thanks all.